Hi, hi, hi. Welcome everyone to this last episode of the lockdown 2020. Hopefully in 2021, there won't be as many episodes, but uh, there you go. You never know. Maybe we'll do an in-person or analog version, but it's a real, real pleasure today to be joined by two very good friends and two um, real, real thought leaders and experts in their field. First, we have Amy Cates, who is the founder of Kate Kessler, the world's leading organization design firm, recently, earlier this year, acquired by Accenture and who now leads Accenture's organizational design practice with Greg Kessler. Her new book is called Network, Scaled and Agile, and it's out in 2021. So there's one thing to look forward to in the next year. Uh, we're going to talk about that and other things. And also Anna Tavis, who is a professor at NYU and running the uh, Human Capital postgraduate education program there, as well as being, of course, a thought leader, writer, speaker, and influencer in all things people analytics, human capital, and one of the most knowledgeable thinkers in the field of HR. So Amy and Anna, thank you for making time. How are you today? Excellent. Thank you, Tomas, for having thank us. Thank you, Tomas. Great to be thank here. Better to have you. And let me start with a question I've been asking everyone, which you can pick either one thing you learned about yourself or humanity or both during this peculiar year. Why don't we start with you, Amy? Uh, well, what I've learned is we can get a lot of work done virtually, uh, but there is no substitute for really human connection. Uh, we're finding that our clients are starting to sneak back together um, and meeting in person. And my prediction in some way is that the office will be more important than ever in 2021, but not for the way it was used before. We're gonna see people wanting to get back together for planning, decision-making, designing, building trust, relationships. The whole idea of commuting an hour each day to sit and talk on the phone will disappear, but, but purposeful convening will actually increase. Are we going to work from home and go to the office to watch Netflix together? <laughs> yeah. Could be fun. Some people were doing it already in the office, but on their own. Collectively, maybe it's more fun. Okay, and Anna, over to you. Anything you've learned about yourself, humanity, or both in 2020? Uh, similar to um, Amy, I want to um, you know, focus on uh, the question of what we've learned from being socially distant and remote. And I think we've learned a lot about humanity, not only um, the digital, the importance of digital tools and, um, and, you know, and the efficiencies that we've learned about, but also how central it is for us to have that face-to-face uh, -face interaction. I think we, uh, as humanity and technology are going to be developing and learning together, um, technology is going to teach us what it means to be human. Um, I think it's really critical for us to be focused on the right issues. And, you know, if we want to achieve, as we always have, um, the outcomes that we want, actually what we are finding is we probably have known less about the humans and what it takes to be human than we knew about the tools that we use. And I think that kind of exploration through the lens of technology of what human behavior is about and what makes us uh, you know, happy, efficient, effective, productive, and all the other things. I think we've learned a lot about um, in this experiment that we were running globally. So I think to Amy's point about the future, I think the future is going to be very blended. We are going to continue to be bouncing off each other um, you know, using these same, these tools, but most importantly, be a lot more introspective and uh, and intentional about um, what the role of humans um, is in that um, new ecosystem of um, tools, technologies, skills, and uh, and humans. Okay, so Anna, let's stay with that topic of the future for a minute. And you know, you were already highly involved in conversations about the future of work, the future of HR and the future of everything. Anything that um, you know, we need to adjust in terms of our prediction given what happens in 2020 or is it the case that our predictions were right and they're just accelerated? Yeah, I think 
the, that the, the predictions are going to stay predictions. We will have to be planning multiple scenarios of the same and kind of the, to the point of being agile and responsive. Um, I think we need to be prepared for various outcomes depending on um, how things work out. And, um, you know, for example, the first reaction of most companies after the maybe a month of being uh, locked um, locked down and quarantined, there's lock, the productivity went up, uh, people relative um, around the flag, you know, we actually did very well on, um, you know, on our deliverables, whatever they were. I think what we've learned later on that we were actually mortgaging out on the relationships that we already had. We didn't have that sense of aloneness and isolation. And so, so the productivity started to go down. So, um, so I think again, so that's, that's the element, the kind of the paradox of, um, you know, being productive in certain ways and being very alone. And, uh, and we will see you know, how the pendulum is going to swing back. And I think where we are right now to Amy's earlier point is, uh, you know, kind of centering in on the idea of uh, blended environments. We're gonna have people going to the office, people are working from home, and the whole idea will be the multiple opportunities to be productive, interact, be creative in these different settings. Okay. Great. So, Amy, over to you. The new book, your book number five, if I'm correct, is called Networked, Scaled, and Agile. I assume, A, you wrote it during lockdown or during 2020, mostly or partly, and uh, the title reflects a response to a growing demand from your clients uh, on these issues. Is that the case? And, you know, are there any questions clients are asking or should be asking now that the world has changed a little bit? Sure. I think that what has happened in 2020 has really just accelerated some trends that were already going on. Uh, we started this book uh, um, in 2019, and uh, it was really sparked by questions that, that our clients were, were already asking. And underneath it is something really interesting, very specific and interesting trend in organization design. There's two kinds of forces going on. On one hand, companies want to have really close connection among their products and services, either for efficiency and scale, or maybe they have a strategy around integrated solutions uh, for their customers. So that's pulling the company together. And you see lots of companies looking to create much more integration or talking about, you know, we're one this or one that. But at the same time, they're actually becoming less global and more local. And that results in an opposite force. And there's lots of geopolitical reasons underneath that that have been going on for some time. So this creates a tension and a balance. And it's, this tension isn't new, but I would say it's absolutely more acute over the last couple of years. And I think it will accelerate given where the world is going. And finding that balance between integrating your products and services and then actually being very local and responsible, responsive and fast on the ground is hard to do well. And of course, it's harder to do when we aren't yet meeting together and being able to align on these really you know, sophisticated trade-offs um, in strategy and organization. Let's stay with that idea for a minute because uh, people were asking about culture, culture, culture eats, poor culture. I say always eating strategy for breakfast must be a very boring life. Uh, same dish every day. <laughs> and obviously org design and restructuring the organization is often, I think, overlooked or ignored as a potential enhancer of strategy. Uh, could it be that now people will pay more attention to org design because culture has left the building and we don't know where it is? <laughs> No, I think culture is, is as or more important than ever. And, um, and for sure, there's a lot of attention to org design. Almost, almost every company has gone through some kind of change this year. Either they were trying to survive uh, because of the industry they were in or they were behind, um, or they're, they're thriving, but they needed to jump on new opportunities. And that created change also. And anytime there's organization change, of course, we create new relationships. And, and Anna was talking about that. The idea is new interactions that result in new decisions. Um, and so as part of organization change, you know, we have to rebuild the fabric of trust in, in some kind of new pattern. So all this change hit just at the time that we 
we can't really build this new trust or it's harder to build this trust because of course we aren't meeting together. We aren't um, using those old ways to build trust, which is literally walking together, eating together, going out for a drink together after a meeting. Um, so think about here at Accenture, 514,000 people around the world. Uh, we launched a new operating model on March 1st, 2020. So the last time the 40 member global management committee was together in person was actually their very first meeting together last February. We actually just wrote a piece um, on how to accelerate building organizational trust um, in these times, because it is so important to culture, to org change, you know, and, and the short, um, you know, answer is it's all about deliberate relationship building, making time for the intentional but non-transactional one-on-one, -on -one, getting alignment of priorities and proactive sharing, things that we know we had to do before, but we can't leave to chance. Anymore. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you if you memorize, if you already learned the 514,000 names of uh, your Accenture fellow employees, <laughs> but I'm sure you're working on I it. I have still. a lot of hey, new friends, <laughs> Hey, Anna, um, you know, people were obviously teleworking, working from home, working from everywhere before. Now we're all talking about hybrid, which kind of makes sense, but you've written a lot about performance management and how it needs to evolve and how companies need to shift from a culture of presentism uh, to evaluating what people actually contribute. Do you think this is the opportunity to do that or is that going to be the problem and why people return to the office and seeing who's in the right place at the right time, saying the right thing to the right person? You know, I think there is a performance management process that you kind of a whole kind of the backbone of what HR does in organizations. And there is a kind of a management mindset. I think there is a very different context for management that this distribution of, you know, people around uh, the world or the country, wherever they are working from uh, will require. I mean, number one is in performance management, there is always a question of measurement, right? If we have a distributed, um, always networked workforce, we are getting a lot more data just based on the fact that people are all connected to the tools, to the uh, technology. So the question of measuring performance, um, and as you know, companies are building in and there's a lot of ethical discussion around what should be measured and what should be not. But there are a lot of different clever ways with the use of technology of tracking people actually working. So that's one thing, the measurement you can actually do literally minute by minute evaluation of what's what's happening and there are different tools that's built in around connecting ai for example doing feedback and providing just in time learning if um, you know if there is a mistake etc so there there are lots of tools that built into the whole performance process so that's one thing that's happening the other to your point kind of ma management by walking around is no longer available and uh, and there has got to be, to Amy's point, there's a huge connection to trust, how you build that trust culture. So performance is moving away from the purely kind of evaluation of transactional actions that people have to a huge importance around trust. Uh, for example, one of the things that I'm exploring now in that space of performance is um, connection between um, human capital of people working and cybersecurity, because the big issue today, as you know, is cybersecurity and what's missing there. We talk about the tools, et cetera, but the majority of those things happen because of human error or be because of human um, negligence or because of, um, you know, how people misinterpret what's being sent to their, uh, to their, to their screens. So, um, you know, without that trust, engagement, um, you know, skills development, et cetera, that will be associated with performance. You know, the whole kind of transactional part of performance that used to be what people were evaluated uh, for is just a fraction of what represents a good performance in the company. And I think we need to be taking on this much more holistic view of human performance, including all of the intangibles and, 
you know, beyond transactional view, another aspect of it, as you're both very aware of, and, and I'm sure, Amy, you wrote about this as well, and Tomas, leadership and collaboration. You know, what's the, uh, what's the uh, in the performance, what's the component of, um, you know, social capital, how it's done, what's the teamwork, et cetera. So I think what we're, where we're moving to with, again, it's only possible because we have the tools to actually see it, externalize it, evaluate it, and understand the complexity of what it takes to uh, be a productive member of the team. Um, I think we're going to see a much more expansive view of performance and the tools that will be used to use it um, for development purposes, mostly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. And, and back to you, you know, you're most famous for your org design work. And, uh, you know, over and over again, uh, when people ask me, who do you know who is an expert in the field? I keep on recommending your book, but often people tell me, you know, if I, if I have a question on org design, I just go and see Amy. How would you sum up your approach? I mean, what's unique or different from your approach, your team's approach to what other people do? Um, and, uh, and, and where do most org design interventions fail if they don't work out? Yeah, <laughs> thank you for those kind words, Tomas. So let me start with the second question first around, uh, you know, what, what often gets missed in org design? And it actually picks up on what Anna was talking about is how do you, how do you get collaboration at scale? How do you think about measuring and making success? So it, it's interesting being now a part of Accenture. Before we were a boutique firm of 10 people. Now I'm in this big system. We're still consulting to Accenture um, as we activate the new, the new operating model um, here. So it's wonderful to have this laboratory in which to work and to actually experience and to live um, an organizational change at this scale. And one of the things linked to what Anna was talking about is very much this idea um, here of shared success and how do you motivate that and how do you measure success across organizational boundaries. We know how to have lots of good collaboration within the team, uh, but how do you do it across business models, across geographies, uh, uh, really across different time horizons? So, you know, what the biggest mistake is companies are, are, they're usually good at designing vertically, right? Each leader designs a logical business unit or function. We look at spans, layers, and jobs. What gets missed then is this horizontal organization and the deliberate design of that, because that's the underlying piece around kind of creating this collaboration at scale. Accountabilities, decision rights, interlocked roles, structured networks, um, this, I, this whole system, I, I call it organizational software of how metrics and performance and rewards and feedback and all of that works together. And, the reasons that many leaders kind of miss the design of the, or, the horizontal organization is not that they don't know it needs to be done, but, but really two reasons we see. One is first, it's just hard work. You know, the design is easy, but the activation takes time because changing behavior requires not just the logical system and willing mindsets, but practice, practice, learning, adjustment, which really requires sustained support over time by leadership. And, and, and that's hard work and we get tired of it. And the second thing is we generally don't like to deal with power issues and organization change shifts power. Um, so I would say the hallmark of our approach is we're honest with our clients and we help them be candid with one another. And that's only possible when they really deeply understand the intent of their new organization. And, and we give them a shared language to build new ways of working together. So co-design, activation, candor, um, just as important as, as the org design tools themselves. Great, thank you. And uh, Anna, let's, if we can return to the topic of analytics and tech, which is an area that we're both passionate about. You mentioned at the beginning that, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening around the human and tech interface. It also seems to me that in the past few years, you know, AI, artificial intelligence is finally joining forces with IO industrial organizational psychology. What do you see happening that is exciting uh, what do you think is kind of, um, you know, overrated kind of uh, shiny new objects, fads? And to your earlier point, how can we convince people that technology, data analytics 
can improve things, fairness and meritocratic, and not get people to freak out and be completely paranoid about it. Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, Tomas, to your latter point, in itself, you know, technology and analytics are not neutral. I mean, they're neutral. They are neither good nor bad, and they could be used different ways. I think that's what we've learned. Um, and I think this is, a, again, where, where the humans supersede technology in a way, and, and human um, you know, intervention is really important, is before technology even uh, created. Uh, because we have a say as to how it's created, whether it creates inclusive, you know, um, design, um, you know, user-friendly interface, et cetera, et cetera. So technology is becoming more and more humanized that way. But I think we oftentimes ascribe to technology some sort of agency on its own, forgetting that we have and we have to uh, play a role in you know, designing that, that technology with a, with a good purpose in mind. So that purposefulness is very important. And once that is established, then it's a question of, you know, trust. Again, what's really interesting that a lot of the conversations we're building around, you know, the importance of trust and culture, et cetera, et cetera, what's, in, what's important is that trust uh, is created not just among the humans, but with the tools as well. You know, do we trust the data? Do we trust the polls? Do we trust um, the story that the data is is uh, the, the data is telling us? And and do we trust technology that is being given to us to do work on? Will it be or to be using technology as consumers, etc.? So I think it's all wrapped up into the bigger context of what it takes to be human and and the human intention and. Um, and I think that because what's out there has been not always used with that good intention in mind, you know, some of that trust is being broken. Um, and, uh, and I think we need to be a lot more intentional to Amy's point about, um, you know, thinking about, you know, what we use, how we use it, to what purpose, and be very transparent. Transparency is really, really important. But it also comes down, Tomas, as you know very well, to education. You know, are people competent enough? Do they have the right skills? Can they have the critical thinking and identify those issues that might come up with technology? And, you know, you know, upskilling people, and that's what I do at NYU, to even be, you know, able to interact with technology in an, in an intentional and educated way and use technology for their purposes rather than become, you know, the, the victims of technology, if we can use it that way. You know, there's a whole, you know, generational shift that needs to occur. Um, so I think there are bigger macro issues around technology and there are micro issues around developing basic skills to, to be living in the environment and the ecosystem we are in, where technology and data are going to be king. Amy, do you want to chime in or any, anything to I I would underscore uh, what Anna said for sure. Um, when we see companies struggling to really, you know, use data and analytics uh, as part of their work, you know, Lacking one source of truth, not having systems that create one view, obviously an issue. The other to the talent piece, not being able to ask the right questions. So every organization is overwhelmed in data, but not necessarily insight. And just calling it an insight doesn't actually make it one. Um, so that sort of educational piece. And the, and the one point that I would add is um, what we don't see is uh, companies that start with the data. So just like any new capability, you have to practice if you want to get better. And what we see companies who are serious about this actually adopt new habits, right? So they start discussions with the data or agree on the data before trying to agree on the solution. So creating habits of how we use it and bring it into our sort of management processes and, and conversations and decision-making then starts to build the muscle. Um, as much as having having the good data or the right answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a famous Warren Buffett line that says, no prices for predicting the weather just for selling umbrellas, right? So it's kind of going from insights 
uh, to action. Uh, Anna, let me go back to you for a second because if I kind of uh, wear my cynical hat, yeah, um, and you know, you obviously uh, are very aware of a rich history in IO psychology with kind of evidence-based human capital practices, not starting yesterday, but having a rich history and tradition in the U.S. and elsewhere. Is there anything really new or is it just kind of a new layer of uh, technology that gets us more granularity around the data? Or do you think there is some real innovation in ideas around scientific kind of uh, scientific management has a bad connotation, but evidence based approaches to manage people and organizations? What's really new? You know, I mean, uh, I, I think there is a, a lot that's new and a lot that's coming that we are kind of on a trajectory, you know, uh, toward that very intelligent automation, very intelligent technology. We, we are, as you know, approaching technology that can learn itself, um, some basic, uh, basic tools, but I think we're also learning from technology, as I mentioned here, about ourselves. Um, so it, we are kind of pivoting around each other like planets. Um, you know, we are learning more about, yes, the, the fundamental umbrella principle is the same. You have to have evidence, et cetera, but at the same time, the impact that evidence can have, or that data and tools can have, technology can have on changing human behavior and even human physique, human body, human mind ha has accelerated and expanded to the point where it's transformational. You know, when we are talking about you know, our ability to transcend, um, uh, you know, what's human and creating kind of cyberborgs. It's no longer a, um, an, a you know, a science fiction. Uh, we were looking at the advances and I think that the COVID will only accelerate it in, uh, in medicine, in um, transportation, uh, space exploration, et cetera. I think the ability to um, advanced technology uh, to the uh, to the point where it's learning and improving itself as is new. You know, it's always required human interactions. And then and now we have to think about being adaptive creatures, um, uh, mammals, basically. How what's going to be adapting within the humans to this outsourcing of some of our functions to technology? So I, it's not new. Um, yeah, by, by itself to, to have those ideas, but now it's reality. And now we're thinking about, for example, take education where I am. You know, the, the whole point is about how can we hijack the learning function? You know, we are, we are really where it's going to be a lot of um, investment made um, in uh, post COVID again is in accelerating human learning and, um, in, in, and it's only possible to the extent that we need it to be uh, through technology, both for planning uh, what to do, what skills to um, you know, change, transition, how to do it at scale, and uh, most importantly, you know, again, how to do it so fast, how to learn and un unlearn um, in a very fast, efficient way. And just as an illustration, an example of that, since we talked about performance management, you know, we are not going to be doing performance management once a year, right? We are going to be do, uh, having these incremental feedback loops pretty much on a daily basis. And not only that, and as I mentioned, we will have the smart AI to deliver knowledge to you um, to again, accelerate your learning and personalize your learning to the extent that um, you will be hopefully accelerating on that learning curve much faster than if you left it just purely to the human uh, human um, brain. Yeah, very good. Personally, I mean, I listen to the feedback from my aura ring more than my wife's. And uh, sometimes if I didn't have a good night's sleep, uh, I deliberately avoid looking at my sleep feedback and score. Um, because if you can't see it, you know, it doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, people are going to see mechanisms embedded. I mean, that's so, Amy, let's return to this issue of kind of being a data driven organization. Uh, I'm sure you both saw in the beginning of the pandemic, the joke of who was the biggest driver or accelerator of transformation, digital transformation, CEO, CIO, et cetera, CHRO, all cross and it's COVID-19 one. Uh, 
do you think that's true? Is it is it the case that this crisis is an opportunity to accelerate this? And when we think about organizations wanting to be more data driven and evidence based, um, what are some examples of companies that get it right? Do you have to be a technology firm to get it right? Are there any basic principles that apply? Um, talk to us a little bit about that. The, the, the kind of uh, you know the org design part of a digital transformation. Yeah, I. I think it'll take some time before we can look back and see patterns and really understand, you know, why in the same industry, similar products, services, customers, uh, some companies have, you know, had banner years and others have, have disappeared. There's a sense that uh, it, it really depended on the path you were on before. So for sure, Tomas, as you say, coronavirus accelerated. I think, you know, Home Depot is one of the you know, examples that's already been talked about and they were had made a big investment in some technologies and, um, and, and ways of work that they were able to build on that and certainly pivot, make new decisions, accelerate and carry through in a way maybe other companies couldn't. Um, so it's hard to know if it's, hey, did we really innovate or we just accelerated what was going on? And, you know, it gets to actually what we talk about in organization design, when you're when you're dominant in your industry and you're making lots of money and you've got the leading product, frankly, org design doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, it's it matters because it matters when there's a crisis, when things are tough, because it really builds that invisible um, foundation that allows for decision making. Uh, and you know, companies that are good at you know innovating it's not about biggest ideas always it's about creating a replicable process of taking ideas making decisions about them bringing to market scaling when it's time to scale uh, shutting down when it's time to shut down and so you know again i think we need a little bit of distance to see uh why some patterns have played out over others over this past year um, but I'm going to guess that it, it's some real foundational kinds of mundane things we made investments, our leadership team works well together and was able to make decisions together. Um, we were clear about roles and responsibilities and the idea that we trusted one another's expertise and then could bring that expertise together. Um, some of this stuff isn't that sexy, but it makes a big difference um, in crises. Is, is the stuff that actually, and this is a question to both of you, is the stuff that actually makes a difference, the stuff that isn't that sexy, and the stuff that is sexy, you know, like Satya Nadella telling us that growth mindset um, they created Microsoft, or now Reed Hastings talking about no rule rules. You know, it seems like there is a desire for a silver bullet and of course, companies read these great books and have these great role models and maybe um, kind of fall into the temptation of, okay, we got to do the same. Um, yeah. So question to both, you know, is it, are these examples kind of, uh, can you extrapolate? Do you have to find what works for you? Uh, are we sometimes oversimplifying the issue? Uh, well, just as long as you mentioned Satya Nadella and, and done work at Microsoft and be able to see on the inside. And, you know, this is a journey that's, that's five or six years old already, that change at Microsoft that is so successful. And it's about his focused leadership and consistent messages. Um, so yeah, growth mindset, but it's not enough just to say, oh, let's add growth mindset to our leadership competency model. Yeah. Um, he's been if very- only, right? If only. <laughs> So anytime, and behind any of these stories is, um, is years of sort of building up um, and you know, nobody wants to hear that. And then it looks like, wow, look at what they did. Even you know, today's darling hire, you know, the, the Chinese appliance company that's very innovative in their organization and business model. Uh, you read about it and it's a, it's a 10 to 12 year journey that they've been on to create something. And, and a lot of it is actually still good fundamental clarity around, you know, decision rights between the market facing units and the functional units. And sure you have internal marketplaces, but underneath that is 
straight up clarity in accountabilities, organizational roles, power relationships that really form the basis of, you know, organization, leadership, and strategy. Mm -hmm. now, let me add to this, and I think the, the best illustration of this concept is the vaccine mm -hmm. and the vaccine development. Because now we're looking at the vaccine and we're saying, oh, look at the miracle, you know, we've never developed a vaccine in such an accelerated way, right? Uh, but if you really talk to, you know, the Pfizer's of the world and, and the people who really came up, or Moderners and et cetera, you know, it took a lot of failure for, for, these, uh, for these companies to actually get to this point. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, the work actually started much earlier with the SARS and et cetera. They were already familiar with the virus, et cetera. And I think, I think we need to look at the success of the vaccine development, um, you know, from, uh, with that lens in mind, that what does it take to build for resilience? What does it make, uh, take to build for, you know, for, you know, adaptability to the, to the next generation of crisis that comes in? And I think that this, what we've just experienced is a lesson in, you know, in, in it will be a big pivot in whatever culture you take um, to thinking uh, away from efficiencies to where we were as a society, and it was the mindset around that, to, you know, what does it take to be resilient? What does it take to be innovative in the face of um, an immediate crisis? So, um, so I think we, we, the, there's, there's got to be a lot more case studies written and um, around uh, this whole vaccine development process. And now, as Thomas, you and I talked about before we started, now we're learning that there's a there's a mutation of this um, you know this um, virus. So are we prepared? What we are understanding is that the the RNA platform that was used, um, messenger on RNA, that it actually has been designed with that in mind that there will be variations and mutations, et cetera. And I think this has to be a feature, not a bug. It used to be a bug in a much more predictive environment. And now, you know, this ability to uh, solve for. And then the other aspect of it, even though Amy was talking about kind of localization of business, et cetera. But again, taking vaccine as an example, this was global collaboration. Uh, across, despite the, uh, the political trends and and uh, and uh, other kind of setup, um, the ability for the Chinese to be transparent around, um, you know, the genetic code or whatever it's called, the 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 um, uh, of the of the virus, and then the entire world, almost like in an open source environment, working on the solution. And I think that this is going to be a really good lesson for us all to learn from and then take it to the level of the company and think how these types of, you know, lessons could be implemented internally within the industries and their cultures. So do companies need to be a little bit paranoid, you know, when they're very successful in a way? And I think, Anna, you spent, if I remember correctly, some time at Nokia. You know, you take Nokia, it was at the top of their game. They laughed at the iPhone and there you go. You know, a few years later, um, we all know the history. Blockbuster could have bought Netflix in the early days. And now, you know, it's almost like we miss it for nostalgic reasons, but no one wants to. So do we need to inflict a little bit of uh, paranoia as a kind of antidote to complacency if our organization truly wants to remain innovative? And by the way, I find it interesting that today we laugh at companies like, you know, IBM or GE as kind of old elephant. But if you if you are at the top of your industry or your game for 50, 60, 70, or 80 years, you're clearly doing something right, right? Exactly. Whereas now we just point to, okay, only Uber, Airbnb, and Spotify are innovative and the rest are dinosaurs. Can you, can you share some insights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and Tomas, you, you, you also you know, have to remember that I was at AIG at the right time too. <laughs> so I mean, I, have it, I had it all, all of the crisis I basically experienced. And, I, and I'm in New York City at the time of the, you know, when the virus hopefully, hit. Hopefully no causal, uh, you no, know. No, not at all, not at all. It's just lessons learned, you know, that's how you learn. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think we've learned, you know, we're talking about a whole new generation of people coming out of this experience of the pandemic. Um, you know, they're, 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 the, um, the students who are in universities now, or even all the way to the kindergarten, you know, when they found themselves in the middle of there, all of a sudden they have to, they're going to learn a very different way. I think we can't blame ourselves for, you know, the kind of the models. And also, in addition to that, the whole kind of management science needs to change. As you know, Friedman, uh, Milton Friedman and shareholders value, et cetera. I mean, look at people like Larry Fink coming out of Black, uh, BlackRock. You know, you see very different management, very different priorities. So part of it is generational. Um, a lot of it has to do with culture, but I think we're going to be in the environment that is not going to let us, it's going to be testing companies all the time. So there's no way of avoiding it. Um, I think whether they want to be paranoid or not, they're going to have to be. <laughs> yep. Amy, any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think, you know, look, one of the advantages of getting a little bit older is that you start to take the long view on things. And um, to your point, you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in the in the in the the fat of the moment. But you look at a company like Google, um, which I've had the opportunity to work with over the last five years, and it's an extraordinary company full of wonderful people. Um, but it's hitting an inflection point, and in where smart people working in teams is not is not enough. Uh, the, the environment is changing, uh, the competitive environment, they're in cloud with new competitors um, and needing to do you know, a lot of this work. How do we work across teams, across boundaries? How do we uh, create that resilience um, for the future? Something we didn't have to think about. So you know, I always think uh, it's like the, the oyster and the pearl, a little bit of irritation and practice you know, creates that being ready um, for the future. So for sure, um, again, I think the work that we're all in, um, I don't see as something that is focused on, you know, what's new, what's shiny. It's how do we go back to fundamentals that we know work and make sure that foundation is strongly there and companies that can then innovate on, from, from that strong foundation. Okay, great. So as my neighbor is starting to bang on the wall, Let's uh, approach or wrap Mine up. Mine also. <laughs> exactly. Maybe they're coordinated, you know, in sync. Maybe they're like doing collect Zoom works, but you know. Uh, let me uh, ask you the final kind of question. Same question to both of you. Uh, it's a it's a dual question. A prediction and a wish for 2021. Let's start with uh, whoever wants to go first. A prediction and a wish. Amy. Okay, well, I already made my prediction um, and probably anybody who made a prediction back in December, 2019, you know, right? Was, was certainly a fool this year. So, so I'll try not to fall into that trap, but you know, my wish, my hope um, is exactly what Anna was talking about is that we see more of what we saw with this vaccine um, production over this year is, is the flow of ideas, of talent, of innovation across national borders. Um, I think it's just one of the most exciting stories um, that a company, you know, Pfizer, that we hadn't heard much about in, you know, since Lipitor uh, 20 years ago, just showed how human ingenuity, technology, leadership, they're still the most powerful combination and, and will never be replaced. And it just, you know, this story, I think if we can learn from it and say, how do we apply some of that to more of what we do um, is, you know, to Anna's point is, is uh, instead of hoping or looking at things as miracles, thinking about them as, is this is what we do as humans. Yeah. You know, in mine, kind of the wish and prediction are com coming together as well. And I think that um, we are also at the, um, um, you know, pivot point in companies realizing that they can just be internally focused all the time. I think there are some bigger mega issues that are coming out um, that will have to do with the communities, with the environment, with, uh, you know, the pandemic. I, I think that was a huge lesson because especially in the U.S., I don't think that was true in other, um, in other uh, markets. 
but especially in the US, there is the there was a very strong elitist silo mentality in all of the companies we have mentioned. And I think that was a big, big, um, you know, aha moment that um, there are actually forces outside of the, you know, firewalls of companies that they need to pay attention to and they have no control over and have to be prepared for. And I think that fragility along with the, um, you know, the solution that we talked about, but, but the fragility and the unity and, and, and uh, you know, literally uh, some existential questions of survival as, as the planet are going to come out even stronger. And we also, my prediction is also that it's not going to come easy. There's going to be resistance. There's going to be a lot of uh, backlash. And as we know, you know, there will be political, environmental and other forces that will have to be overcome. So I do not think that there will be an option to be complacent. I think we all have to be prepared and ready and do as much as we can to contribute to, you know, the progress of, you know, this planet, humanity and individual companies and ourselves individually also um, and to, to, to succeed. Well, thank you both for making time and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and I wish you a great holiday and I hope you can relax a little bit, recharge and that next time we meet, uh, it's in person. Thank you so much. No, I hope so too. Thank you so much, Damas. Thank you, Amy. A real pleasure. Next time in Brooklyn. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, so. thank you. Okay, bye-bye.